Next, we're going to talk about the second law of thermodynamics and the idea of reversibility, so the, the reversibility of a process. Again, the second law of thermodynamics says that the change in entropy has to either be greater than zero or equal to zero. And this tells us the direction that time points. So in this example that we've been doing all along, this, these molecules, if we could gather them all over to the left side of the box, then at some point, maybe by collecting them over there or putting a membrane in between two halves of the box, if we release that membrane, then eventually they'll diffuse and fill the whole box and reach a higher entropy state. The state on the left-hand side is a higher entropy state for all the reasons that we've said already. It has higher probability, it has less capacity to do work, but in addition, it also has more accessible states for all of its molecules. So these molecules in the left box could have much more ability to move than the molecules that were in a box, say, half of its size. And so just increasing the volume and allowing the molecules to diffuse into a larger volume automatically increases the entropy. And since S is higher at the end, then delta S must be greater than zero. This process is an irreversible process, and you can think about it like this, the, the, these molecules are never spontaneously going to go back to the one side of the box. And so that means that this process has to be irreversible. You can't, it's not going to just happen like that and flow that way over time. We can also talk about reversible processes. These are processes for which delta S equals zero. In fact, any any system on our PV diagram, which is a cycle, has delta S equal to zero. And this is because this entropy S is a state variable, much like the temperature, the pressure, the volume, the number of molecules, and the total internal energy U. So that means that if you're at the red point on this PV diagram, you can do anything you want and move away from that red point. But if you come back to that red point, the entropy at that location will be the same. That's because the number of accessible states or the probability of certain accessible states is dependent on these other variables, T, P, V, total internal energy. And so if those are all going to be the same at that red dot, then that means that S will also have to be the same at that red dot. So far we haven't actually talked about an equation for entropy. And in order to actually do this, which you can do using calculus and taking sophomore level physics or maybe even the upper level statistical mechanics course, you can actually calculate the states that a thermal system will be in and actually directly calculate the entropy for any one state. Slightly easier though is actually determining the change in the entropy between two states. And that's because it's directly proportional to the change in the heat to go between those two states, so the heat added between those two states, over the temperature. And given this definition, that gives us the units of entropy to be joules per Kelvin. Because remember that the units for heat transfer are joules, which is energy, and in our current units, the units for temperature are Kelvin. This is the same units that the Boltzmann constant has Kb, or little n number of moles times R has. They both, they all have units of J uh, joules per Kelvin. This delta Q term can, is the heat transfer, and of course this can either be positive or negative. Temperature always must be positive, so that implies that the entropy can also be positive or negative. Now that seems counterintuitive because we just said that the second law says that change in S always has to be greater than zero or equal to zero. So how is it possible to have a negative entropy change? This, is, this can happen when energy is taken away from the system, the number of accessible states of that system decreases, right? The molecules just can't move around as much as they could before. But that heat has to go somewhere. And when it goes somewhere, it's going to increase the entropy of wherever it goes. And when it increases that entropy, the total system, which includes all heat transfer, must be greater than or equal to zero. And that means that your entropy will either be equal to zero or it'll increase for the entire system. Sometimes it can be really tricky taking this whole system into account. Let's look at another reversible process. Now that we have our new 
um, definition for the um, change in entropy as proportional to the change in heat, we can see that there is one thermodynamic process that we've already study, studied, which is automatically reversible always. Can you remember which one is the, is the right one? I'll give you a hint. It's the one where heat does not change. Okay, that's probably enough time. I'm assuming that you've already thought about this. So the, the thermodynamic process where heat does not change is called an adiabatic process. And this is, again, P changes, V changes, and T changes. But these are the processes in which S does not change. And this means that, um, and the other thing that we have is P1, V1 raised to the gamma power, where this gamma is equal to 5 thirds, is a constant. So any time that you're on one of these lines, which go between two different points, but have this property where pressure times volume raised to the gamma is a constant, those are adiabatic lines, and on those adiabatic lines, that's where entropy is conserved. So, just like we had before with the, um, with the change in work, which was equal to PdV, this equation can actually have P depending on volume. So what I mean by that is that pressure can be a function of volume. So that means that when you want to calculate the work, it's not simply good enough to just say that it's some random pressure times the change in volume. Pressure can change with the volume, and so that means you have to be able to figure out what it is. The same thing is true with delta Q. In fact, we define delta Q as being proportional to delta T for many systems. So how do we figure this out? So I'm going to do a little bit of calculus. It's integral calculus, which comes from calculus 2 class. Um, and so, but you won't have to do any, but I just want to do this so that you can understand where this comes from. So we have delta S, and that's actually equal to the integral of dQ over T. So little d stands for a little tiny infinitesimal change. And if we do little tiny infinitesimal change in heat, um, then it's, the, it's a little change where temperature doesn't change very much over that. And again, we can rewrite the change in heat dq as c dt. So now we have a function of temperature in this integral and now this is a very straightforward integral to do where you get the natural log of t. If we put in our limits where we go from t initial to t final then what we get is that the change in entropy for a system is c, the heat capacity, times the natural log of tf over ti. So we had to do a similar type of calculation to find the work due to an isothermal process and we had a very similar equation come out where we had a natural log of the volume ratio. So this is the same type of calculus. You will not have to do this. You will not have to do this on an exam. I just wanted you to know where it comes from. So any material that we know the heat capacity of and the initial and final temperatures, we can actually calculate the change in entropy of the process as it heats up or cools down.